All right. Good morning. I feel like I should stand on the floor. There's like this whole like three rows empty. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> All right. I am Pastor Stephanie. I'm the associate pastor here at Grace Community Church. And I just want to welcome you here this morning. Um, we are finishing our series on the book of James today. Can you believe it? It's been eight weeks already. Well, nine weeks, nine weeks, nine weeks already crazy. <laughs> Time flies. Um, so for this series, we have been looking at the focus verse that says from the first book of the first chapter of the book of James, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. With this question in mind, do you have a genuine knowledge of faith or genuine faith in action? And we're going to talk a little bit more, more about that at the end. But today we are looking at the last seven verses of this book of James, which is a letter, right? And so we're going to look at the scripture, we're going to break it down a bit, and then we are going to talk about the action plan, which is just a recap of the whole series, because that's what God wanted to do today. <laughs> and so let's jump right into James 5, starting with verse 13. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with the oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain in the, on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth, and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them both from death and cover over a multitude of sins. And as always... James is rich in wisdom in how to live this life that God, that God, God has called us to. And so we see the breakdown of these verses. We see in just even the first two verses of this section, two or three verses, we see four topics of prayer in just a couple of verses. We see prayer in trouble, prayer when you're happy, prayer of confession within community, right? And, 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 we, and, and it also mentions the prayer of a righteous person. All of that in just a few verses, right? So in verse 13, it says, is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. The word for trouble there is to suffer misfortune, which is sometimes illness, sometimes not, sometimes anything, something's going on in your life and you're suffering misfortune in that moment, right? If you are, pray about it, right? And so he's telling us, if, if, is anyone among you in, in trouble? Let them pray. And it goes on to say, is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. And that word for happy here is not just, oh yeah, I'm just happy and I'm feeling happy no matter what's, like, because things are going well, right? The word for happy here is, re refers to a deep-rooted happiness, a contentment of heart, so regardless of what's going on in your life, are you happy? Even if things are tough, even if things are weird, even if things are anything, right? If you're happy in that moment, that, 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 that deep-rooted happiness, that content of heart, pray. Sing songs of praise, right? Sing songs of praise. Enjoy that, even if life is still crazy at the moment. And then it goes on. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have, been, if they have sinned, they will be forgiven, right? And so the word to call here, the word that they say to call the elders of the church, right, suggests that, that the situation is dire. There's like the word, the word sick here is for any weakness, okay? So something seriously wrong, there's a sickness, there's a weakness, there's something going on with someone, there's something seriously wrong, bring all the people, right? <laughs> bring all of the people. Let's pray for this person, anoint them with oil, pray for them in this moment. 
Um, this word weakness is the same word that Paul uses when he talks about the thorn in his flesh, right? Over in 2 Corinthians 12, it says, Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But, 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 but he said, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness in insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties, for when I am weak, then I am strong, right? Now, they, they, there was this idea back then, because one of, part of that verse that is, is said, if, if you have sinned, your sins are forgiven. There was this belief, right? And it still exists, right? That if you're sick and if you're weak, it's because you've sinned, right? We, we, we saw that in our series on Job. All of his friends tried to convince him that he was in sin, and that's why all these things were happening to him. But in these verses, it says, when we're called together, when, when we come together to pray for someone who is sick or in a weakness, if they have sinned, if that's the reason this is happening, right, they will be forgiven. Is it always that case? No. Sometimes... It's not some only thing that God's put there, and we, we, we just need to pray for them to get through the process that God has them in, right? It's not always because you've sinned that you get sick. In John 9, 1 through 3, we, we, we see this with Jesus. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, said, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him, right? And so there's so many different reasons, not just that one, which is what a lot of people still thought at this time, right? But come together, gather together, pray for one another, right? Call the elders of the church, anoint them with oil, pray for them. And then it goes on to say, in verse 16 in James, therefore confess your sins to one to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. We see this idea, right? We see this, we, we see, see this idea here, like tell people what you're struggling with. Open up to each other. We're all on this road that God has us on together, right? He has called us to live in community with each other. We can go to the Lord for on, on behalf of other people. Because I'm like, hey, I was talking to this person and they're struggling in this area, right? And so I can go to God and be like, hey, this is what's going on. I'm, gonna pr I'm praying for them right now in this moment, right? If it's a group thing and you're, and you're praying something together for your group, you go together and you talk to God. Hey, this is what we're dealing with, right? We, we see examples of this in the Bible. We see this with Moses. He prayed on behalf of all of the people, in Exodus 32, it says, So Moses went back to the Lord and said, Oh, what a great sin these people have committed. They have made themselves gods of gold. But now please forgive their sin. But if not, then blot me out of the book you have written. Right? He's like, I'm standing in the gap for these people. And they've messed up. Forgive them. I'm praying for them right now in this moment. Nehemiah did the same thing. In Nehemiah 1, 5 and 6, it says, Then I said, Lord, the God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins. And he goes on to talk about all the things. We as a nation have done all of these things, right? Pray for us. Daniel did the same thing too. I pray to the Lord, my God, and confess, Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments. We have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws, right? All three of those people were like, hey, I'm praying not just for me, but for us, right? We're dealing with stuff. We're supposed to live in community this way. We lift one another up. We, we pray for one another, and we're there for each other, and we open up to each other. We talk to each other. What? Talk to each other. <laughs> tell you tell people what you're, what you're struggling with, because then it's brought to the light, right? Because then you have double the people to help you work through something. 
jumping back to James, it goes on to say, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Now, a righteous man is the one who is committed to God and to, and, and to doing God's will. I am committed to you, God. I'm going, I am doing God's will. I'm cultivating this relationship with you because I love you, and I'm cultivating that so I know your heart, right? The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Why? Because they have a relationship with God. They, had, they, they have cultivated a relationship where they can know God's heart. And the, when they're praying for you, when, when we pray for each other from this position, like, I am committed to doing God's will. I'm in this. I'm, I have a personal relationship with him. I know his heart on things. You know what? Then that person, then we already know what God's heart is in that area. Or we've asked him, and we already know, okay, this is what God says about this, so this is what we're praying for, Right? Because we, we can pray what we want all day long. And, and he will hear those things. And he will hear us, and we will fill up the bowls of prayer, prayer, prayers, a, a petition, all the things. He will hear everything. But amazingly how effective it is when we're like, God, what do you want to do in this situation? And pray for that. Because then God's like, Yep. You're finally on board. Let's go. <laughs> right? Those prayers are powerful and they're effective because it's already God's idea. <laughs> and he talks about that this is just who, who we can be. We can be the person that is doing God's will, that is committed to knowing him, that is getting close enough and cultivating that relationship to know God's heart on the matter so that our prayers can be powerful and effective for one another. And he gives the example of Elijah, right? Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He's like, he was just another person, right? He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it didn't for three and a half years. Then he prayed again, and it rained. Amazing. That's crazy. <laughs> That's awesome, though, right? This prayer is powerful because, like I said, they already have... They, they've already discerned God's heart on the matter and God's leading in the area, right? And then James ends this chapter and ends the letter with this. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring that person back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. We have a responsibility to the people around us. Because we're in a family. If you've chosen to believe in God and follow Jesus in your life, you're like, I am part of your family, God. And I don't think there's anyone that would look at someone in their family and be like, you can just do whatever you want and I don't care. Right? We're family. It shouldn't be that way. If it is, it shouldn't be. We should be looking at one another. We're allowed to look at one another as a family of God and be like, hey, I've noticed this. This isn't of God. This needs to shift, right? This needs to move in your life. Like, God just keeps put, putting you on my heart when I'm praying, right? To keep, like, to get you back in line here. It may be a hard conversation. It may be like, hey, what you're doing isn't right. And I've just got to tell you that. What they do with it after that is on them. But in Hebrews it says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, right? Instead of not, <laughs> let us spur one another on. In 1 Thessalonians, it says, therefore encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. Encourage one another and build one another up. Encourage one another in the right things in the God things, in the way that God wants us to live our life. I'm going to build you up in this area because you're doing awesome, right? And you know, I'm, I'm going to encourage you, and I'm going to encourage you to move forward, and I'm going to give you anything that I can, right? Prayers, anything you need to encourage you to grow in the areas that God is growing you in, right? And, man, we need to do that for each other. In Ecclesiastes, it says, Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up.
but pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two, two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may, may be overpowered, two can, can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Right? God calls us to live in communities, to be praying for one another, to be encouraging one another, to be pulling people back when they start wandering off into things that aren't of God. It says that right in James. The book of James. We're finishing that today, right? The whole thing is full of, <laughs> watch your mouth. <laughs> Be careful of your heart, right? This is the way that your, you, you, your, your life should look in walking with God. It shouldn't be that way. It should be this way. All five chapters, which isn't a lot, but there's so much in there, right? All, all these areas that God wants us to lift one another up, to bring someone back, to bring them back over where they're supposed to be, right? Next week, we're starting a new series called Where's the Line? And it's going to be a series about where's the line on certain topics on what is Christian behavior and people that follow Christ? Where's the line? And are we tiptoeing over it into not doing Christ-like things? When we need to step back and be like, nope, that is the line, and this is where I'm supposed to be, right? And I, and, and I think of that with this, with the last few verses of James, with the, if you're wandering off, if one among you, so th this isn't just someone that you're just meeting, right? He's not talking right now in this instance to people that are that, that, that you're introducing to Jesus and bringing them into the fold, right? This is one that is among them. One among them in their church, in their fellowship, in their community. If they start to wander off, bring them back. And we need to be okay with doing that for others and letting others do that for us without getting offended. Because it can be so easy because of our own trauma, woundedness, life experience, any of it, to not be able to take constructive criticism. Because in our culture that we're in right now, it's not encouraged, right? <laughs> it's just, well, you do that and whatever, and it's not going to work, but I'm not going to tell you because it might hurt your feelings, right? So I'm not going to do that. You know what? It's worth hurting your feelings if you're not living your life right. Because then, then you'll just keep wandering, right? It's like that, that, that song that used to be around. It's a slow fade when, when you give your life away. <laughs> you start wandering, and then you start wandering in, in, in other things, and then you start wandering in other things, right? Well, back here, when you started wandering, someone could have been like, hey. You're like, oh, yeah, okay. And then you didn't end up way over there because they had one simple conversation. And so we think of the book of James, and so... Our action plan today. So I was praying, and I'm like, okay, God, this sermon's super short, right? What are you doing? <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know what you're doing. And he's like, we already talked about all the things. Just talk about all the things all over again. I'm like, okay, sure. So we're going to go back and set my sound my quickly. Not quickly. I don't care. <laughs> go back and look at some of the action plans and questions and stuff that we have ended the series with, right? To just refresh us on it, challenge us once again if you miss them, right? And so way back in the beginning, week one, in the first chapter of James, we talked about the action plan of, we talked about our heart, right? And that, 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 that we realized that our heart is the problem because sin can be rooted in, in our heart and grow up in us. And so what can we do about our heart? And we had this plan, right? We connect with God. We say, hey, I got to connect with you because there's something that's going on in my life, right? In that, that, that chapter, it's, it talks about um, your words, right, and what you say. And we, and we looked at the verses of, like, the overflow of the heart is what the mouth speaks <laughs> and watching our mouth. And so how we deal with those things and how we let God work in those things as we connect with him. We ask him for help. We ask him to identify what's the real issue here, right? We listen. We respond to what he says and walk in obedience and listen to, and do the things he asks us to do. And, and it's hard. And, and, and we persevere through that. We push through that 
Even though, even though, it's, uh, though it may be a little challenging, it may be a little uncomfortable, God doesn't call us to comfort, right? It may be a little uncomfortable, but then we grow in it. We grow in it. I'm trying to think, was that the week that, no, that, that, that wasn't that long ago. All right, so we connect with God, we ask, we listen, right? The next week we talked about, do you know his ways are above your ways, right? Do you know that God has reasons for things that we don't understand? His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. There's verses that say that, right? He sees the whole picture. (laughs) We see this much. (laughs) We're looking through a keyhole, and he sees the whole room, (laughs) He understands what else is happening, right? His ways are above our own. And do we remember that? And just reminding us to think that way. It's like, okay, God, you're not surprised. I say that a lot lately. (laughs) I feel like that's been my phrase of the year. God's not surprised. (laughs) Because he's not. He saw it coming. What surprises us does not surprise him. Because he's God. And we are human. And we're a blip, right? (laughs) In the grand scheme of things, (laughs) we're a drop in the ocean, right? But you know what? God loves that drop in the ocean. And he knows every single drop in the ocean. (laughs) And he wants us to remember that his ways are higher than ours, but we can trust him in it. And the next, next week we talked about, does mercy triumph over judgment in your life? Does mercy triumph over judgment in your life? How quick are we to judge someone we know or don't know? I think I used my driving example for this one. Are people bad drivers? Well, in my opinion, but that doesn't mean anything, right? (laughs) I shouldn't call them names because they're not really that thing. They're not really idiots. I'm just annoyed, right? But, But does mercy triumph over judgment in my life? And will I forgive those who have not shown me mercy? I'm called to live this way, regardless of how other people handle it. Will I forgive people even though their heart's still not in the right place? Even though they're not being merciful? Will I forgive them anyway? These are all ways that we're supposed to be living. This Christian life that James has laid out for us, right? Connect with God. Know that God's ways are higher than ours. Live mercifully and not in judgment. And remembering that our works don't save, right? The next week we talked about, Sam talked about, our works don't save us. Doing things for God doesn't save us. They're evidence that he has saved us. It's like, hey, he has done this. He saved me from my sin. He saved me from a life, from no life. He saved me from death, right? Right? What I can do for him is just evidence that I'm like, yes, I understand that, and I'm going to do what I can to love him back and show him and have that relationship and connect with him in a way, right? And people see that in our life, or at least they should, right? What evidence in my life demonstrates my love for God? What evidence in my life demonstrates my love for God? I was rereading this, and this phrase popped in my head, this question of, If we went into your workplace or your community or who you spend time with, right, and ask them if they knew the people in their workplace that were followers of Jesus, would they say your name? Would they know, do they know where you stand? Do they know that you love God and you're a follower of God, a follower of Jesus, would they know that, even if they don't know you well, would they know that something's different about you? What evidence in my life demonstrates my love for God? Do people around me, when they see me in the store, I gotta work on this one because I have a resting, grumpy face. (laughs) Sometimes when I'm tired. (laughs) Do they know when I'm out and about, living life, 
when they see me in my car, right? I don't know. Maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> what evidence in my life demonstrates my love for God? So what can we do about our hearts? I think I had that question on the wrong one. It's on this one, not the other one. It's all good. <laughs> so what can we do about, about our hearts? Because we know that there is sin there. We know that there is things planted there that aren't supposed to be, that aren't of God, right? We respond correctly. We go, oh, yes, that's an issue in my life. God, this is an issue. I need you to help me take care of this, right? Own it. Because, yeah, 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 I did that. I did that sin. That is there. It's not who I am but it exists in my life. And going, God, it's there. I repent of it. I don't want it to be there. We pray, right? We, we allow God to clear up our hearts. We allow God to make the changes. And we allow him to do it, not just be like, oh, I see it there, but let's just bury it up. And then it won't exist anymore, right? If we just bury it. It just stops growing. Is that how that works? No. Sometimes you can bury a plant and then it just grows right through, right? Just dirt. <laughs> Same thing with our sin and with, and with our struggles. You can't just bury them and hope for the best. You're like, God, help me get this root out, right? Help me dig this up. It's got to go. And sometimes he'll take it right then. And sometimes he'll like, you got to work on this one. But I'm with you. And you can persevere and you can grow through it, Right? Then we talked about how is God calling you to humble yourself and submit to him? Because there's things in our life that God has planned for us. There's things that he knows are there, right? He's like, this is what I want you to do. You just need to walk today in obedience to what I'm saying so that tomorrow you're more on track. And the next day you continue to walk in obedience and then you can make sure that you're right where you're supposed to be. You're right in the middle of God's will. You're like, I, I've been obedient as far as I know. So as far as I'm aware right now, I am where I'm supposed to be. Because I, all these past days, weeks, months, whatever, I've tried my hardest <laughs> to listen and do the things that he has told me to do. And listening for God and asking him, is there something that he's asking us to submit to him still? right? To humble ourselves and be like, okay, God, I haven't been willing to work on this, but I'm submitting it to you now. Let's do it, right? And then he went into, are you living God's will or your own? Are you relying on him or yourself? Because so many times we can just make the plans, right? We just make the plans and we make the th things and we're like, duh, duh, this is what I'm going to do. Five-year plan, right? This is my five-year plan. And God's like, are you going to ask me? Are you, are you going to ask my opinion? Is that a thing? Can that be a thing? Let's, let's ask him, right? Because we can make plans all, all we want that are our plans. But he's like, you can have a five-year plan that gets you to this point. Or you can follow my five-year plan that gets you to this point. Right? <laughs> Because so many times we don't ask his opinion, but he has one. Because <laughs> he has the master plan. He knows he has the plan that he designed us for. We just need to figure out what that is and walk with him in it. Like, yeah, God, you designed me for this, and so this is what I'm doing, right? Not like, well, I like this, so I'm just going to go this way, and God, I just want you to bless me in it, right? <laughs> I'm just going to do this and hope for the best. Does that mean, no, now, that does not mean that we just stand still and do nothing while we wait. Well, God's going to tell someone, and they're going to tell me. So I'm just going to sit and do nothing, right? Because then that doesn't help. Because <laughs> then you're not doing God's will either. Because you're sitting doing nothing, waiting for him to say go. And you're like, no, I don't. There are some things that God has that he tells us in his word that we, shall, we, we, we all should be doing, right? And a lot of these things we're talking about today. If nothing else, I'm going to do the things that I know God wants me to do. And I'm going to move in those things. And I'm going to look for the open doors and all of the things that he has. 
and I'm going to walk through them as they come, right? Or when they close, I'm not going to shove through it anyway and do my own way. Because I can do it myself and not with him, right? Now, last week, Ted talked about, does your life reflect James's instructions, right? Are you training in patience? Are we eliminating grumbling? Are we staying faithful through hard things? And are we speaking honestly? Like, let, let our yes be yes and our no be no, right? And a lot of these are topics that he covered elsewhere in his letter also in James, which brings us back to our series question. It all comes back. <laughs> we start with it, we end with it, right? Do you have a genuine knowledge of faith or genuine faith in action? We have gone through James now, the whole thing. So now we know all the things that James told us. This is what a follower of Christ looks like. And we can just keep that all in our head. Be like, well, I know it. So now we all know it. So now we have a knowledge of what faith looks like. But do we have the action that goes with it? Do we know that it's true and we get it up here in our head? Or are we walking it out in our everyday life? And, that, and that's the big question. Because so many times we can know lots of stuff. We can know lots of things about God, right? When I, I went to a kids' ministry training. This just popped in my head. This is funny. <laughs> I went to a kids' ministry training one time, and they were talking about teaching kids not just about God, but teaching kids to know God, right? So up front, they had a pan. It literally looked like kitty litter and poop. I'm not going to lie. It did. And they're like, what's in this container? And everyone's like, uh, why did you bring a kitty litter box in here? Right? Was it kitty litter and poop? No. It was grape nuts and Tootsie Rolls in that box. Right? We can be like, it's in a kitty litter box. All of us thought... <laughs> There's kitty litter in this room. Why is there kitty litter in this room, right? But upon closer inspection, there's actually grape nuts and tootsie rolls. But we can look at something and think we know what it is. And we can look and we can know what faith is. And we can know the things that we're supposed to be doing in our life. And we can know them in our head. And not actually pay attention to what they actually are. We can know them and not walk in them. For me, the phrase that I grew up with hearing in youth group and different places was be a walkie-talkie, right? Walk the talk. Talk the walk. Do both. Because we need to be asking him, if we don't, if there's areas of our life that we know what we're supposed to do, but we're not doing it, right? Something needs to change. And so what needs to change for you? What needs to shift? What needs looked at again, right? Because sometimes it's something that we dealt with a long time ago. We're like, well I, well, I dealt with a big chunk of that a long time ago, but now it's flaring up again, and I don't know, you know what I mean? It's just kind of coming up, and I don't know what's about. I'm like, whatever, and, we're like, and God's like, well, you let this, this, and this in your life, and so that needs to be curtailed a little bit, right? Let's not do that. Um, but what needs to change? What needs to change for you that people will know at your workplace, at the store, at wherever you spend your days, right, that you are a follower of Christ, that you are a believer, and they'll know that, and they'll know who to come to with, with things when, when, when they're struggling. They'll know who to ask questions to, right? We can be a safe place for people if we allow ourselves to be, if we're living it in our life and we're doing the things and there, and, the, and there was that really ugly verse, I think it was at the end of chapter 4, that said, if you know the things you're supposed to do and don't do them, then there's sin for you. Well, guess what? All of us just learned the whole book of James. We're all in trouble, okay? Because <laughs> there's things that God asks of us. And he's like, this is what I'm saying. And if we choose not to do those things... That's a sin for us. 
or, or if we choose to do things that he told us not to, right? Because we have to watch, and, and we'll talk more about this in the next series, but we have to watch the influence, right? The, the influence that we allow in, because it'd be great and dandy that we're here on a Sunday morning and we hear all the things, and then we're going home, and we're listening to whatever on the radio, we're watching whatever shows we want that have all kinds of influence in them, and we spend way more hours outside this building than we do inside this building. You're here for one to four hours, depending on if you serve one and worship one, right? <laughs> Attend one, serve one. You might be here longer. You might be here four hours, three and a half, three. The rest of your life is spent outside these walls. What happens in here is supposed to encourage you for living the rest of your days. I don't have control <laughs> over how you spend your days. That's between you and God. We can encourage you. I can encourage you up here and whoever I have up here speaking. I can, I can encourage you and show you and give you the knowledge that you need to live a life with Christ. But walking it out in your everyday life is up to you. I was talking with my brother yesterday. He was re reading a book on grit, right? <laughs> on that push through things, like the able to do hard things. And um, I remember that I need to pull back out a book that I started and didn't finish, because that happens a lot, <laughs> called Spiritual Grit. Because sometimes we need spiritual grit. We need that, I'm going to push through this. I am going to allow myself to become this and not let other people's expectations change that, right? I am going to become more patient in my life. I am going to watch my mouth, and I'm going to not say the harsh things. I'm not going to say the crude jokes. I'm not going to say all of the things, right? Anything, anything that God puts in your heart, I am not going to do those things. I'm going to do the right thing despite the people around me that still expect me to act the other way. Because we're all growing and changing. And someone can say, well, you didn't used to be like that. No, you're right. But I've grown since then. And I've changed since then. And I'm under transformation at all times. Because... Who we are doesn't change. We're someone that God loves. We're someone that God designed in, in a special way. But there's parts of us that change as we grow. We transform. We morph into Jesus, right? We're supposed to be transforming more like Jesus. Looking more like Jesus every day. Well, well you know what happens then? We can look in the mirror and be like, I don't know if I understand this person, <laughs> right? In a good way. Not in a bad way. Those we always tend to take that ne negatively. I just don't know. I just don't recognize this person anymore. I just don't know who I am anymore. Really? Is it not? Is is it that you don't know who you are, or that you've disconnected from the process and gotten stuck? And you're like, now I don't know which way to go from this point because you're in between, <laughs> right? Growing in this area and not growing in this area. Have you chosen to take the step forward and make the full change, right? Because I've I said to myself, I don't even know. I don't even know what's going on, right? And God's like, I do. Keep going. Keep pushing. You'll get through this, and then you'll become this, and you'll have this fruit of my spirit in your life. And people then will see it, and they'll either accept it or they won't, and you can just remind them that that's not who you are anymore. And that's okay. But God has a different life for all of us. And he wants us to walk that out in our life and not just know all the details. I can tell you all the fruits of the Spirit. That doesn't mean I'm living them, right? I heard it once. This was ugly. I heard it once. Like someone some was talking. It might have been Nate, actually. About the fruit of the Spirit. And how it just says fruit of the Spirit is one thing, right? Even, even though that there's a list. And it just really was on my heart when I heard that. I'm like, okay, 
If I look at the list of the of the fruit of the spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, right? I can see all the things. Which one are you worst at? Right? Which one are you worst at? When I think of that one, I think of self-control. <laughs> right? I'm like, okay, my self-control is here. But if fruit of the spirit is one fruit, then everything is at that level. That was ugly. But it just got it just popped in my head, so here you go. <laughs> That's a freebie. <laughs> But he wants us to grow in all of those. And he does that work, right? We just do whatever he tells us to do. We're not the one that changes it. We're the ones that changes our behavior. All right, we're going to pray. And we're not going to do a song. Because, you know, we're supposed to live in community. And if something struck you, well, then talk to the person next to you about it. Find someone in the room, right? Meet somebody and be like, ooh, this got me today, right? Talk to one another. <laughs> Just like this, it's in that verse, confess your sins to one another. If there's something that God's putting on your heart, being like, hey, this surfaced, so for, can you pray with me about that, right? Grab somebody, grab me, I don't care, I'll be up here. <laughs> grab someone and pray together. Talk to each other. It's a good thing. God calls us to live this way, right? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for being here with us today. I thank you for your leading and guiding. I thank you for the teachings in the book of James that you want us to live out in our life, Lord, that you would right now just put something on our heart, that you would reveal to us ways that you want us to, different ones of these questions, different ones of these action plans strike us different so that you would bring one specific one to mind that you want us to work on right now in our life or, or encourage us in. And I just thank you for being here with us. I thank you for the way that you challenge us and the, the way that you want us to grow in you, to grow up in you. And I just thank you so much for being here with us today. I thank you for the blessing of everyone that is here and the blessing they are, they are to us here at Grace. And I thank you so much for them. Holy, Holy Spirit, as we leave this place and live out our everyday lives, that we will be listening for you, that you will open our hearts and open our ears and open our eyes to what you're doing around us, that we, that we will walk in obedience to anything that you tell us, anything that you give us the sense of, Lord, and I just, I just pray for that whole Holy Spirit, that we will be walking with you this week. In Jesus' name, amen.